Seed Beneath Your Beautiful podcast is raw and intimate, sometimes funny, and always entertaining. With new episodes every Saturday, Hara explores our loves, fears, and hopes with a delicious combination of depth and lightness. In episode five, we interview Terry O'Connor. Terry, will you introduce yourself? I'm Terry O'Connor, and I don't know more. I guess I'm Hara's friend. <laughs> But that's all. <laughs> I'm a fellow seeker. I think we're both seekers. Yes. And what do you do for a living? I uh, own two flower shops called Rose and Blossom. And I've been doing that for 28 years. Really blessed to be able to bring joy into people's lives and make their world beautiful. You really do. It just absolutely makes a difference. It's important for me to do things not for money, but for joy. And this definitely brings me joy. And luckily you make money at it also. I keep doing projects where I get no money, but it does bring me joy. So (laughs) (laughs) I got to figure out how to marry the two. (laughs) (laughs) Someday. Statistically, only 25% of the population sends flowers. The rest, they might pick them up at grocery stores and things like this. But actually like going to a florist and sending Only 25% of the population does that, which is kind of interesting. That is interesting. I photographed a gentleman who was having trouble finding a girlfriend. And he was saying, oh, I I could pick up a flower from the grocery store. And I was like, that's why you don't have a girlfriend. But why is that? Why do I think that? There are definitely some quality flowers at grocery stores too. But, you know, it's just... Like why somebody doesn't do a brochure themselves on Word. You know, there's just this finessing. When we design flowers, we literally are putting energy and joy into those flowers. And so then those flowers are going out to the world. And I sincerely believe that that energy is going in there. And so at the grocery store, is there anybody like infusing them with joy before they leave? It sounds silly, but honestly, I believe it. I believe with my whole heart. I believe that. And also, not just that they're infused with good juju. There's something so special about a knock on the door and the flowers are for you. I remember one time, it's been years and years ago, but I did a delivery. And this woman, was she happened to be out at her mailbox. So I caught her and I got out of the car and she and I said, you know, these are for, you know, Mary or who it met her. And she's like, me? And I said, yes. And she just started crying instantly. And she goes, I have given this man 25 years of my life, three children, and, you know, on and on. And she said, this is the first time I've ever received flowers. The power of that was wonderful. That's so cute. So you said you're a seeker. And the last person I interviewed was Randy Johnson. And she had such cool things to say. And in the end, I asked her if she could recommend a book, which book would it be? And she said, The Four Agreements. And you're the one who introduced me to that book. And so I was going to ask you about The Four Agreements, what you think about it. It's so funny because I always, I just uh, Googled it because I, (laughs) even though I know I absolutely love The Four Agreements, sometimes I forget what The Four Agreements are. (laughs) You can tell if you listen to the podcast episode, you can tell that I only remember, don't take things personally. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, I love all those things. Always be impeccable with your word. Mean what you say and say what you mean. And this is not easy for me because we're supposed to be nice. I tend to not speak up or say what I mean and mean what I say because I'll be a bad person if I do. So that is, I love to always go back to that. Like, no, just say what you mean and mean what you say. If it's a no, like stand by that. So I love that one. And then the other one is don't take anything personally. We talk about that a lot with perspectives or stories. Everybody has their own story. You can't take it personally. We all have our own thing going on. Gosh, it's a good one. Don't take it personally. Are you good at that one? I think you taught me and Byron Katie love what is. and. uh I'm getting much better. I would say the same for me. I still notice that I, you know, take things personally. As soon as I notice it, I can change it. And then don't make assumptions. 
which, oh boy, oh boy, I have a story of making assumptions. It was a big lesson learned for me this Valentine's. A gentleman came in the shop. We were so busy. So right away, I'm busy and don't have time for it. You know, I'm just not my best customer service at that point. <laughs> so usually they keep me in the back room because it's like, ah, Terry gets stressed. Don't put her up with customers. But this particular one, I don't know. They brought me up because they were just like, he wants something special. He wants something a little different. So they show me on his phone. And honest to God, a two-year-old could have made it. It wasn't a professionally done thing. It was like these crazy roses down low and this baby's breath, just crazy. And so right away, I went to an assumption. I didn't stop. I didn't listen. I didn't hear him. Well, my assumption was this guy's an idiot and the recipient is going to hate this. I paused and I thought I was being all you know, because honestly, I, I thought I was being impeccable with my word. I thought I was saying what I mean and mean what I say. So I thought, you know, I'm going to just be honest and say, this is not the kind of work that we do. This is not professionally designed. And so it doesn't represent us. So I can't do it. Well, he got furious with me and he was just like, I'll go somewhere else. And, blah. and I just thought, okay. And I felt bad right away. But, you know, I was like, I need to stand up for my work. Then he called and he talked to my um, my manager, which I mean, I'm the boss, but I hired her to run the store. And he says, the reason I wanted that is because it was my wife's last day of chemo and we celebrate with fireworks. And I wanted the baby's breath to represent the fireworks. Uh. I love life lessons. And I got to tell you, I mean, I could cry right now. Yeah. <laughs> thinking of it. Me too. I mean, that was a life lesson. Don't make assumptions. Listen, if I would have taken 10 seconds, so everything up in my brain, it was me, 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 making assumptions of, oh, this guy doesn't have taste and blah, blah, blah. Had I just listened and, and I would have known that story, I could have taken his inspiration, nailed it and made all the difference in this world. I will never forget that lesson. Don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions. Yeah. And then the last one is always do your best, which I never have had problems with. I mean, I say that arrogantly, <laughs> but my mind, I always, always try to do my best. You know, my best on any given day might not be that great, but my heart is always in doing my best. Yeah. I read that book, I would say 15, 20 years ago. And I think that was a great foundation will always make mistakes and offend people accidentally and continue to put our foot in our mouth. So another way that you're a seeker is you chant or do chanting. And I don't even know what I'm saying or talking about. So could you explain that to me? So that I actually got into when um, my husband's ex-wife, Lynn, she is a Buddhist. It was kind of funny because my Steps and Corbin would say, what, when we were starting to get to know each other, like, what religion are you? Well, I'm Christian. And he's like, well, what do you believe? Do you believe in reincarnation? I said, well, yeah, I believe in reincarnation. And, well, do you believe the only way to heaven is through Christ? And I'm like, well, no, I actually think, depending on the person, there's a lot of ways that they can be spoke to and they're each, each their own path. And he's like, you're not a Christian, you're a Buddhist. And he was like 11 at this time. And I'm just like, well, whatever. And so he told his mom that. And so anyways, when she was in town, the next time she took me to lunch with one of her friends from the Buddhist SGI, it's called. And they told me about it. They're like, do you want to chant? And I'm like, sure, I'll chant. So what we chant is nam myoho renge kyo And so it's called Daimoku. And we say it over and over. nam myoho renge kyo nam myoho renge kyo nam what that is, is it's a, it's Nichiren Buddhism. He was a Buddhist monk in the 1300s and he narrowed it all down to the Buddhist teachings is just that very last chapter of the Lotus Sutra. The purpose of chanting is to just reduce our suffering. There's cause and effect and it just changes our karma and brings about enlightenment. We have a Buddha nature. So where we come from is a Buddha nature. And so we just have to wake up to it. We just have to realize that that is always with it. It's not like we have to do something to attain that. We just need to plug into it. When we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, 
it's also like a meditation, just quieting our mind. Hopefully then you'll have more wisdom, you'll get clearer, and then also have more compassion. And then the last thing is courage. Chanting absolutely has helped me with that. We do chant some other things. So we also say prayers from the Lotus Sutra. It's like Myoho Renge Kyoho Ben Pandainini Jese Sanju Sanman Anjo Niki Go Shariatu. I have no idea what I just said. I have no idea. When I say Baruch Atoy Denoy Elohenu Melchalom, I have no idea what I just said. Right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I know how to repeat it. Yes. Basically, it all just comes down to is that we believe that there is a sacred law and that governs all universe and us, which is our Buddha nature. And we're just tapping into that. So we have faith in our Buddha nature. You go to, is it a temple? It's a community center. We don't have any priests or clergy or anything. It's just a lay person's organization. I also dabble in Tibetan Buddhism. I also really enjoy that. The Lama, Lama Lekshi, had a little center, a song guy, they call it, but he's moved to California now. So I'm taking a class from him via Zoom on Wednesday nights. And so he's just like an amazing Tibetan monk with so much wisdom and super hard to listen to. You took one class, huh? <laughs> I couldn't understand what he was saying. Are your parents religious? No, interestingly enough, um, I have been a seeker, gosh, I would say since I was 10 years old. And so dad grew up very religious. Um, You know, they went to church every weekend. He went to a college that you had to go to church every day. And so when he married my mom and moved to Montana, dad's church turned into the outdoors. This is our church. But all my friends, were Catholic. And so I would go to Catholic mass with my friend uh, on the weekend. And so I always piqued my interest. And so my aunt on my dad's side, she's super, super religious. So at a young age, I would ask her about it and she would give me books. And so I educated myself as a Christian at a pretty young age, but my family wasn't necessarily. So fast forward to college. Then my first husband was Catholic and we got married by a Catholic priest. I thought of myself as a Christian. Um, We went to the priest that was marrying us and my husband said, you know, Terry maybe wants to go through some classes because she's concerned she's not baptized. She's going to go to hell. And um, Father Crawl was his name. Just said, take your pagan wife home and tell her she's fine. (laughs) I mean, as a joke. Which we laughed, ha ha ha, my pagan wife, blah, blah, blah. He, you know, he didn't think I was going to go to hell. But still, I felt rejected a bit. Yeah. But I've never been worthy of baptism. So then, fast forward another 10 years, I got a divorce from my husband. And I then got baptized in the Lutheran church. My my sister's family was super supportive. On my brother-in-law's side of the family, the Schmidt family was wonderful. And it helped me a ton through my divorce. And I earnestly and really sincerely prayed, you know, and I really would say that Christ helped me through my divorce in a big way. In the meantime, my family became religious during that time because my sister married into a religious family. And so, and then mom and dad, they don't go to church, but they just have more religious influences. So, well, then I met Mitch and then, you know, then Corbin put this idea in my head that I was. Buddhist. And then I'm just a seeker. And so I became Buddhist. I don't consider myself a Christian. I do consider myself a follower of Christ, but none of the Christians will agree with my idea of Christ. (laughs) So, so, but the thing is, because I always do my best and I am sincere, I honest to God think, you know, I'm praying to Christ because I've had Christians tell me like, if you just seek him, you'll go back to him. We have a good relationship, Christ and I. And he 100% said to me, you're a Buddhist. So I'm super comfortable in that. I started to ask about your parents, if if they were religious, because I'm wondering if you feel judged at all by Christians. I'm just fascinated about this topic. I do 
feel judged by Christians, but in the most lovingly way. Mm-hmm. Um, none of them, not in a judgy, you're going to hell, just in a, they absolutely love me and, it, and they're terrified for my soul. Most of our family, friends, everybody's Christian and, and strong, great faith Christians. And then I'm the Buddhist over to the black sheep. They don't understand because I know for a fact, all of them are very intelligent people. And if they just knew and understood, it's really more of a philosophy and a way of living right now versus, you know, I'm not concerned about afterlife that much, even though I believe in reincarnation. It's about right now and just overcoming suffering right now. I just truly believe that any way you can get there, should be okay. Everybody has their own way. You know, like you said, your dad found it in nature. My dad used to say, I'm a good person and my God loves me. And that is the philosophy I live by. For as long as I've known you, you've always had some kind of coach. And so what are you always trying to learn? Have you ever listened to Alan Watts? He basically, back off, just be. And so I'm actually now experimenting and seeking just being oh I love to get a master's degree in me but there's a pressure we put on ourselves like why do I have to be better tomorrow because am I not good enough right now does spin your head because basically there's no answers that's what Byron Katie says is that you have to have a questioning mind because who knows I think I'm comfortable with that and accepting that well I'm proud of you for not coaching for a minute Right. I am still coaching. Oh, you are? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm trying to seek something else. <laughs> you know, baby steps, baby steps. And I love this analogy he makes of water. So it's like the universe is like water. I mean, we're not going to be able to grab it. We're not going to be able to hold on to it. From one minute to the next, it's changing. It's ebb and flow. And so the only thing we can do is just start swimming. And go rolling with the waves. And I, I love water in general. And so I loved that. That spoke to me, that analogy, because it's like, cool, let's do it. You know, this is all just a fun ride and it's all play. And I'm just going to play along. Yeah. And so there's no fear of failure or fear of anything. There's no fear in trying to do a podcast because what's the worst that can happen? I'm learning through this in the same way that art is a lesson for me, that I have to just put it out there in the world and hope people will hear it or the right people will hear it. That'll speak to somebody or it doesn't have to. And it's just an art project. I have to give up all control of it has to be a success or it has to be heard. It just is. It's just a joyful moment between the two of us at this moment. Right. That's the other thing I've learned recently. I love March. March is when Mitch and I fell in love. March is when the NCAA basketball, March Madness is going on. Spring is coming. There's hope, everything. I just love, love March. Well, I'm a huge fan of Gonzaga basketball and I always enjoy it so much. But in the last 22 years, my March, early April, has always ended in disappointment. Not one time have I ended with like joyous. And then you realize I still absolutely love March, even though it ends on a sad note because Gonzaga lost. But it's like, oh my God, that journey, wasn't that journey marvelous? And that's it. Gosh, it's fun. So are you just saying that the, if you can just get over the, the end result and enjoy the journey? Yes. I didn't need a national championship. I can't believe that that people feel this way about sports. I just have to say. I I saw a Facebook post that said something about Gonzaga and they they said they were heartbroken. And I was like, really? (laughs) (laughs) But I, I think they were sincere. Oh, yeah, we're sincere. But I don't understand at all. Right. I know. I'm not a sports follower, but even if I was, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't let it mess my day up. (laughs) More or less my March. You know, I play competitive tennis and people always ask me, how are you so Zen? And I'm like, because it doesn't matter. It's just tennis. It's the joy of being competitive and going out there and trying your best and having fun. 
I don't put any pressure on myself. I really want to win, but it's okay if I lose. Yes. I love that. I think that's a great lesson learned too. Just focus on the journey. Just absolutely love that. And not even figure out the end because that's when disappointment comes because you put an expectation. It could be an even more brilliant end to everything. It could be, you know, we don't know. I don't even like to watch a trailer on a movie. I don't want to know what's going to happen. I like living that way. I like not knowing. When we drove back from Montana, you were telling me some interesting things. You had a happy divorce. I didn't have a good divorce at the time, but I love my divorce. That happened so organically. And it wasn't because I was trying to get over this or, or, or becoming a better person. Divorce and sorrow, you're just literally trying to get through the next five minutes. You know, this sense of loss. So I was just trying to survive. And so I kept myself busy with all these things. I took painting class and I took dance class. And I went to this contra dance thing where you just spin and spin and spin. And I was dizzy and sick for a week. But you know, <laughs> I got in the best shape of my life, which people do. And so I loved where I was physically and, and I ate healthy and it was the very first time in my entire life I lived by myself. So I bought my own home. I got baptized during that time. So all these things and this like awakening happened in me. I had just this great confidence and I didn't know it as it was happening. But then you looked back and it was like, oh my God, I love, love, love where that took me. Cause here I am today You probably didn't want a divorce, but life is so much better because that happened. And if you're going through a divorce or you want a divorce, just remember that there's peace on the other side. Well, the other thing, I was very present in the moment and I didn't exactly even understand that concept back then. It wasn't something I was trying for. Grace just happened to me. You know, I didn't fight it. I didn't blame. I think a key to is just absolutely no matter what, take responsibility for yourself. As soon as you take full responsibility, as far as did I make him happy, instead of feeling sorry for myself, I didn't hear, I didn't listen. He wasn't happy. Take responsibility for that instead of saying, oh, he was a jerk and he did this and he had that. I blamed my ex-husband for so many years for our marriage. I don't think it was until my Katie, so like 16 years later that I saw myself, I was a terrible wife. I was not a good partner. We were not friends. I, I, it wasn't like I was friendly and he wasn't. It, we were together. We were not friends. When I took responsibility, all the anger I had towards him just dissipated instantly. Yes. And I also realized that I couldn't hold him to a standard. I couldn't live up to myself. One of the things I wrote down was, he should love me no matter what weight I was. And by the end of the Byron Katie conference, I thought, well, I don't love me whatever weight I was. How could he possibly, if I didn't love me, how could he love me? All right. That was the experience that I had. I fell in love with Terry and I didn't even know that that's what I was doing. Mm. You know, I realized that with you saying that. So that was a real gift. <laughs> Divorce. <laughs> if you can gift only one book to somebody... What book would you give to people? Would it be Byron Katie or Eckhart Tolle or, you know, those are two that I go to. Do you think they say the same thing in different ways? It's identical. Mm -hmm. Right. And the power of now is exactly what Byron Katie teaches, but Byron Katie says it differently. In which case, Byron Katie's is a little bit easier to grasp. And there's this actual active, you know, activity of doing the work. And so Mm -hmm. I do think any works by Byron Katie. I also like that dying to be me. Anita Marjani. I loved that book too. She was in fourth stage terminal cancer and just on her deathbed. And then she came back and was completely cancer free within like a month after this. And it's a really good book. I like it too. Do you have a life mantra or anything like that? Well, I do have a life mantra. Everything always works out for me. I've gone through a lot of, um, you know, divorce was this beginning and I've had miscarriages and bankruptcy and just stress, things like that. I don't know at what point I picked it up, but I started to say everything always works out because it just does. This minute, you're okay. 
And it's funny because my employees, I've had some in the past. She always just thought I was magic. Everything always works out for Terry. It's going to be fine. You know, <laughs> we would be in the worst situation possible. And she's like, she can blow fairy dust out of her <laughs> arse, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so they believe me around me. They don't necessarily always believe it for themselves. Well, if they did, then everything would be fine. Exactly. They need to grasp that. Oh, I love that. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and chatting with me. I love you so much. You make me feel like a superstar. You are a superstar. I was honestly nervous because I was just like, oh, I don't know why she'd want to interview me. And then I thought about it, you know, a lot because we had the <laughs> failed attempt one. And I thought, you know, I was just too nervous. I was too canned on that one. I'm like, I'm just going to talk because every time you and I talk, you know, we have a lovely friendship. <laughs> and... Terry McCoy is my superhero. She teaches me how to be photographed. She teaches me how to be on a podcast because I listened and I was just like, oh my God, she's just such a joy. And she's so this and that, you know, I just appreciate and admire her, but not in a bad way. Just like, oh, you know, what a joy she is. And then it's like, what did she do? Mm. Well, Terry was just herself. <laughs> how about me be that? You know, so I have to give her credit. Well, <laughs> I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and I, I really like one called Smartless with Will Arnett, Sean Hayes and Jason Bateman. And they're so great. And they have the biggest names come on, like George Clooney and Kamala Harris. And, and I was thinking... My goal in life is to let, you know, you're beautiful just the way you are. And I think you're a superstar just the way you are. You're worthy of this conversation. I think that about everybody. So that's the whole goal is that you don't have to be a, an actress or the vice president of the United States. You have such a gift because you always make me feel beautiful. And I learned so much from you. And like you have that gift for making people comfortable and to talk. Because you yeah, are a good listener. You. That's that's learned. <laughs> that wasn't always true. But thank you. I appreciate that compliment because it is a huge compliment. I just want to know all about you. And whatever you have to share is worthy of sharing. That's what I think. So thanks. I learned all about chanting. I didn't really understand it. And I'm your good friend. I've never really asked. I don't know. I don't get it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't judge you. I really feel passionately that however you come to whatever you consider to be God or Christ or the higher power or whatever is perfectly fine with me. I mean, what do I know? And what do you know? Especially because as a Jewish person a Jew with Jewish heritage, if I don't believe in Christ, I'm going to hell. It would mean all of my ancestors are in hell. My father, who was the nicest person I've ever met, he said, you know, I'm a good person and my God loves me. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to go with that one. <laughs>